This is a follow-up interview to the previous one that I did with author David LeBlanc. Um, he's got a book out. The uh, was it the Magic Blood? It's uh, there's no such thing as magic blood. No such thing as magic blood. Yeah. All right. Uh, and we had some good uh, interaction, and we had some positive feedback. People uh liked our interaction there. Um, so when we're um kind of handling the uh the sources trying to get back to the most original method. I kind of feel like the analogy of the story with um, Abraham and Isaac, where he's taken Isaac up for the, the binding of Isaac and he's carrying the double-edged blade, you know, that he was carrying that as, to, I guess, to protect his son from that. Uh, when we're trying to conserve the truth, what people would call it is more of a liberal, we're looking at the text historically versus the theological versions of it. Uh, a lot of people would consider us liberal, whereas uh, I think we're conserving the truth. They're trying to get back to a more original truth um, is kind of a concept I, I like to play with when I, you know, we're trying to handle it with care, even though we're deconstructing prop popular notions. So let's kind of get back into some of the topics last week. Um, kind of to start it off. I had a, a comment or something I kind of wanted to bring up and see what your thoughts were on this. Um, drug addiction is a feeder or a gateway drug to Christianity. It seems like a lot, a lot of times, you know, the heaven and hell, the conviction message, the altar calls, there's a lot of emphasis put on what I would say uh, emotional weakness as a way to gain access to community. Mm -hmm. And then they offer guilt and uh a sense of love and family and stuff like that as a method to mm, satiate uh human need uh in the place of real real solutions i mean what would you think of that statement or yeah uh well i'll give two different answers i'll give uh my opinion on the question and i'll give my personal experience uh secondly so my opinion on it is I think, and I've thought about this quite a bit over the last 30 years, uh, people I found, and I've dealt, just for full disclosure, I've dealt with a lot of people who have struggled with drug addiction because uh, when I was in the church, I used to be part of outreach groups that used to deal with uh, uh, addiction and, and people that were in recovery. Uh, <clears throat> I think that there's a certain uh, proclivity for people who are attracted to mind-altering drugs and addictive substances uh, are already unsatisfied with what they're experiencing in their version of reality. And they're looking for either a way out or an answer to get through and to get to something better. And so the evangelical message comes up in these contexts as a uh, almost a panacea. It's almost like we have the ultimate solution for you. Because it, the message, of course, is that the, the root problem is not in the substance. The root problem is in your deficiency. And there's only one way that you're going to fix that deficiency, and that's through the completeness that comes through a relationship with Jesus. So this is the inroad that people find with people that are struggling with uh, addiction. Um, and you combine that with what you just described as the offer of community, the offer of support, the offer of uh, a place to call home, if you will. Uh, when I was involved in Calvary Chapel, there was a number of people who were involved in the volunteer staff. Uh, one of them ended up becoming part of the paid staff who had come to the church through the radio station after having been basically strung out on addiction. And they came to the church feeling like they had nothing else to live for they had lost any sense of personal dignity or meaning. 
and this message of you know jesus is the hole that fills that gaping spot in your life um again this goes back to what i wrote about in my book is that jesus is not a person when it comes to christianity jesus is a concept jesus is a philosophical concept that gets promoted in whatever context the denominational setting is in and in the context of a ministry that wants to reach out to you know drug addicted people or homeless people or any of these downtrodden elements of our society it's always going to be the jesus of i forgive you come rest in my arms it's never going to be the jesus of you know throw over the tables in the temple it's always going to be the jesus of compassion the jesus of i understand your struggle i mean recently there's been an advertising campaign that's been launched and i've been seeing it because i watch football uh a lot of the football uh, broadcast i don't know who's paying for this but they must have a lot of money uh basically showing a scene where you have like for instance in one of the ads you have a family that looks like they're very poor and uh at the end of the ad it says jesus struggled with his family too and then the end of the ad says jesus gets us dot org and this is the new marketing campaign that jesus is the is the all-consuming uh great warm hug for all who struggle in life so again jesus is now a concept he's no longer a person He's a concept being promoted by the church to fill a bill. He's no longer a historical person that existed in a space and time uh, that practiced a certain uh, ethnocentric religion. He's now a marketing strategy to win the lost. So that's one issue. I'll go back to my personal situation. Uh, I remember when I was in college, um, and this is going to sound funny, but I had the idea at one point during the second semester of my freshman year that if I could read the Bible backwards, <laughs> I would un unlock the esoteric mysteries behind the Bible. <laughs> this is an idea I had. And right. uh, I don't know where that idea came from, but the idea was based in the idea that that there's something being hidden from us, like like the text itself is a is a veneer that we have to get beneath that something is beneath all this and it's going to reveal its secrets as we pursue them and so i was somebody who i wouldn't consider myself to be a drug addicted person i had one year in my life where i experimented with everything i get my hands on because i was intentionally trying to figure out a way to expand my mind and that resulted in a born again experience at the end of that process. But I wasn't like a typical um, person that would find himself in a crack house or, you know, off the, you know, on the street living in a shelter. I was never the, one of those persons. I was always in control of myself, but I was uh, certainly experimenting. And I found any spiritual message that would, uh, that would appeal to a greater sense of knowing who you are than what mundane everyday life could offer was appealing to me it was something that i wanted to explore and so i do think because of the seeker friendly nature of modern evangelicalism that uh that people who are down and out in their life it doesn't have to be involved with drugs it can be just it can be financial it can be family, you know, the family has just has destroyed, it can be a divorce, it can be the loss of children, it can be any number of things, loss of a job, even uh, any sense of displacement that threatens someone's someone's sense of self, and their sense of dignity. Uh, religious uh, rhetoric, I think, appeals, naturally, to someone who is feeling like they're just grasping at straws trying to figure out what rope could I hang on to here to survive uh and I think religion plays a very important role in that and and I think evangelicalism in particular attracts a lot of people who feel like they've made a real mess of their lives and they they view the church as 
as much as they view Jesus as their salvation, they view the community that accepts them as their earthly salvation. And so for those people who are in that boat, it's extraordinarily difficult to ask critical questions of their faith. They have a really That's hard time with that because yeah. of the emotional connection they have to the community and where that emotional connection comes from. That's my opinion. I, I mean, I, that doesn't cover everything, but that's just what I've observed. No, but yeah. Um, because of, I would call it a trauma bond. Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good phrase. The, uh, the rationality isn't as present. And when you pre present them with facts, they become emotionally uh, entangled and therefore conversations when it move in a rational way um because you're right. attacking a personal element of their life correct um so i kind of want to preface before i kind of move on to to the next questions here um i'm not i you know in deconstructing the myth of christianity i'm not attacking christianity or good christians who have a good moral compass and want to do good um you know, my rabbi, when I went through conversion, said, you know, Christianity is a valid religion, you know, on its own. That You know, um, when you come to look at historical texts and you start to reconsider, you know, your beliefs based in, you know, historical or science evidence based values, uh, you start to reexamine these things in a way that's more rational, more grounded less emotional less theatrical less mythological um and it's a transition um you know my effort in this isn't that everybody do what i do but to offer assistance to people in their journey to find truth uh in a more holistic way uh before we get back into kind of my questions about christianity even ministry and stuff um one of the ways that I found meaning was through the Musar tradition, uh, the mystical traditions within Judaism. I didn't get too much into Kabbalah, or, you know, Hasidic mysticism. Found it interesting, you know, the Tanya stuff like that. Um, in your journey, you did some studies into that. What was your uh, experience in, in studies into like the mystical traditions within Judaism, like Musar, Tanya, Kabbalah? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's a particular, well, let me just say quickly before I answer your question directly, I do appreciate the approach you take to both your blog and your channel, Jeremiah, because uh, there are many people in this sphere of, of, of activity that are actively seeking to destroy and tear down. Uh, and there's a certain tone and an attitude with some of these programs which is very mocking in its orientation. It's, it's just, it mocks anything that smacks of the supernatural or, or any kind of belief that people have. And I, I find that approach to be counterproductive to what they're thinking they're accomplishing because uh, you can't mock people's journey. Uh, if you start yeah, off, I don't think it's helpful. yeah, it's not helpful because you alienate people because you don't know it, it, there's so many different connective tissues that that let us progress to the point that we're at and it's very unique for each person um and and the mocking approach or the denigration approach however you want to phrase it 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 completely dismisses the holistic value that people experience in a sense of community setting whether whether or not the people believe in the dogmas being proclaimed, many people experience a great sense of comfort just in the presence of others who accept them as part of their community. Uh, I, I've been involved in many religious environments. The vast majority of the people in all of those environments, whether they were Christian or Jewish, were completely oblivious to the vast majority of the teachings that were being promulgated by by the core elements of the faith they were simply experiencing the community and so when we when we you know take our intellectual analysis of religion and we we just kind of 
whitewash people that are involved in it as being blind sheep, we're really doing a disservice to them as human beings. Um, and so I really appreciate what you're doing here because you have a very scholarly approach, but you're not attacking anyone and you're not, you don't have a, you don't have a spirit of, of uh, mockery. Uh, you're not a joker, so to speak. You, you, you're, you're serious about wanting to help people. And so that's why I've been willing to come on your program, because I think you're doing things the right way. And I just wanted to express that, that I really appreciate that about you. Um, but back to your question, um, which now I'm trying to remember what the question was. I got off on a rant and I can't remember exactly what you asked me. I think you were asking me about uh, the mystical side of religion. And uh, my well, experience. well, before you go there, um, I just want to say thank you for that. Um, I think that... Um, the mocking and the derogatory tone comes from people who were emotionally harmed by the community they left and they carry that on in their, I would say, combative tone. I, I just think it's less than helpful. I agree. Um, yeah. But yes, so to, to the back to the question I was asking, you know, because for me, I find the Musar tradition to be spiritual enriching. It's something that I kind of practice and filter and there's a level of mindfulness and stuff that kind of gives me grounding um i would because you've studied some of the mysticism i was wondering about your experiences with musar kabbalah tanya yeah. and kind of what your experiences was within that tradition so uh, the answer to the question about musar and mysticism is a is a loaded question very difficult to answer succinctly um and the reason for that is because well, let me just say this that every religious tradition that we have records of uh, just about has an esoteric element uh, some might call it uh, an inner mystery school or uh, the secret teachings behind the text you know that, that that's that's a that's a reality in just about every religious expression there's always an outer truth an outer expression of the message and then there's there's an inner understanding among the deeper discipled initiates of the movement. Uh, so my experience in mysticism is interesting because, and in Musar particularly. Uh, so as I was saying before I realized we weren't live, uh, I own all 15 volumes of Lakute Maharan, which is the masterwork of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Now, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov was acknowledged by the fourth uh, master of Chabad uh, nowadays since Schneerson because the Breslover movement has been growing so rapidly in Israel primarily there's there's some competition elements between Chabad and Breslov uh, uh, today uh, if you were to bring forth a teaching of Rabbi Nachman in the Chabad shul they would smile and basically dismiss you but there was a time within Chabad when 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 Nachman was considered to be a you know an equal to uh, to the author of the Tanya. Now the, now the Tanya you re you reference the Tanya. The Tanya is the spiritual guidebook of Chabad. The Tanya uh, is a uh, comparable work to Lahuti Maharan. It's not quite as extensive. But it has a philosophy of human existence before God that is core to the understanding of the Chabad movement. Um, Nachman's Lakuti Maharan, if I was to be a critic, a secular critic standing from the outside, I would call Lakuti Maharan a philosophical treatise of Musar. And I've had rabbis tell me that these Hasidic extrapolations, such as the Tanya, such as Lakuti Maharan, are nothing more than Musar. They are, they are uh, leaving the derrick of, of uh, what is the, uh, the acronym for, um, not TULIP, that's Calvinism. Uh, it's I'm just drawing a blank on the whole uh, the text versus the uh, interpretation versus the allegory versus the esoteric. It's 
um, it's sowed. So sowed is the esoteric. And you've got Peshat. Peshat is the is the literal. So you get the literal understanding of the text. So for most Kabbalistic Jews, the Peshat is merely the doorway to the beginning of the initiation into the hidden mysteries. Uh, you find this also in early Christianity. You have the spiritualism of Alexandria under Philo and his school. Most of the works are lost today because of the burning down of Alexandrian library, which was tragic. Uh, we have a little glimpse into it with the discovery in 1946 of the Nag Hammadi uh, library, the, the, uh, the Gnostic Gospels, which there were dozens of them. Um, there was a certain perspective. For instance, Philo uh, wrote in his writings about a Jesus who was confronted and killed in, in space, essentially, by the devil. That Jesus, And he names him Jesus. Philo calls him Jesus and says he's not a man, but he's an incarnated being who does battle in the spiritual realms against the enemy uh, and defeats death. And through gnosis of this person, you can achieve transcendence, basically, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, Sounds very Pauline. Very Pauline, exactly, yes. Uh, in fact, Paul, as you know, is considered by many Gnostics to be the founder, founder of the Gnostic Christian movement. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that statement, but that's what a lot of people contend. It, what, one of the things that's inconvenient, I'm going a little bit of a rabbit trail here, I want to go back to your question, which is my personal experience. But one of the things we have to remember is that once the Roman Catholic Church took power, which was around the late third, early fourth century, they censored out and redefined that which was against their message. So the only thing that we have to go by to judge, for instance, the works of Marcion or the works of any of the earliest Christians is the criticisms of the Roman church fathers. The polemics, which, yeah. Right, the polemics, which makes it very difficult for us. We have to really parse out because everything we read is, is, is like you said, a polemic against what we're trying to understand. And so we're not getting a proper representation. It's almost like trying to understand somebody's testimony by only listening to the accusing lawyer. Uh, that's a problem that we have in historical reconstruction of the early Christian movement. But that being said, my personal experience is that um, I, I'll use the example of, of the Breslov rabbi that I studied under for a number of years. Uh, he was an older gentleman. He had been raised Orthodox Jewish, had become a Chabad rabbi, was ordained with Chabad. Uh, through various negative experiences he had with Chabad, uh, he became a little bit disillusioned with that movement. And eventually he was introduced to the Nachman movement and he became a Breslover. Um, he received vitriol and loss of friendship from a lot of his Chabad uh, previous colleagues when he switched over. But one of the things he said to me, well, not to me personally, but it was to a group of us, when he was explaining why he switched from Chabad to Breslov, was it was nothing against Chabad, because he believed in a lot of the spiritual principles that they stood for, but it was just in general, his, his personal spiritual journey was that there had to be something more than simply the observance of mitzvot. There had to be some spiritual undercurrent to the Jewish experience, or he was no longer interested, as, as heretical as that would sound. He was just at a point in his life where he felt dry, he felt spiritually uh, kind of orphaned, and he was looking for something deeper. And so Musar, I guess back to your question, I'm using that as an example, because I feel that this is a phenomenon 
that exists in all religious expressions. I think in, you can look at Christianity, whether it's Roman Catholicism or evangelicalism, or if you get into some of the, you know, the, the, the micro denominations within evangelicalism of Pentecostalism versus Assemblies of God versus Calvary Chapel versus more, you know, some of the more liberal expressions like the United Methodist or what have you, uh, you're going to find people in various percentage groups who are looking for something deeper than what the plain text reveals. Uh, and the problem with that, there's a problem and there's a benefit. So the benefit of looking that way is that Musar can add a great deal of depth and value and a sense of purpose to one's spirituality. And, and we should probably give a definition. Maybe you should offer this uh, for our audience. What, what would be your definition of what Musar is? You know, Musar, you're, you know, tikkun, tikkun mido, repairing your characteristics, right? Repairing your character. It's a way of, there's cheshbon nefesh, journaling aspects. Uh, you're trying to, in a way, repair your soul by meditating on various character traits you know there's a mindfulness to the tradition i personally like you know the focus on the midot and then there's the hover you know where you come together and um you have somebody that you kind of work through it with like a discipleship you know, program basically yeah yeah, so, yeah I, I, I got this book right here the book of midot book of midot mm -hmm. there's so, a there's one i have i think it's um I'm trying to think uh, of the guys because it's more of the conservative tradition. It's everyday, I mean, don't everyday first. holiness. Yeah, I have everyday that on my holiness. shelf. That's it. Yeah, yeah, I have I that, that on my shelf home. too. That's a good book. Yeah, that's so a good book. my my understanding of of Musar from a Jewish perspective would be, so the medot are like the hinges that swing the door. So you've got you've got the mitzvot based upon the halacha. And then the Medot, and this is the way I would have taught it, it, like in the small groups that I used to lead with youth. So you've got the Halakha, which is the law, period. Then you've got the Mitzvot, which are related to the Halakha. So this is what you have to do. This is the law. But then the Medot would be the inner understanding of why we're doing this. So the Medot, and then in a more practical sense, like we have certain principles of behavior which would lead one into proper observance. And this would be the medot, which is why it was explained to me is it's kind of like the hinges that swing the door. So the door is you're on one side of the door, the other side is proper observance. So the medot and musar in conjunction with this is something that allows the door to swing open so that you can properly approach the mitzvot. So that's from a Jewish perspective. Now, I don't see much difference in that, although there's a lot more technicalities in the Jewish expression, but in a Christian expression, I don't see a lot different. Although the Christians would never understand the word musar, they would never use that word. They would use the word disciplines, disciplines of the spiritual life. So a Christian would take and they would, like, for instance, a second organization such as Promise Keepers, which is well-known, right? Very controversial, but well-known organization, a men's organization that tries to get men to focus in on home and focus in on their responsibilities to their wife and children and, and you know, stop trying to, you know, please themselves and just take it on the chin, basically, for your family. Uh, well, that's not a lot different from than from what the Breslover book that I have, which is... Uh, what is it called? Um, uh, the Garden of Peace. So I have this Breslover book called The Garden of Peace, which is all about how to have a godly marriage. And the whole premise of the book is the same as the promise keepers in the Christian world. It's men, take it on the chin, take responsibility. It's not your wife's fault. It's yours. You own it. That's basically the message. And that's the same message in The Garden of Peace. So when we start getting into Musar, I find it very interesting because I had a conservative rabbi, and this is why I used uh, Nachman as an example, because I had a conservative rabbi and I asked him, I said, have you ever been interested in the teachings of Rabbi Nachman? I said, I, I study Lakuti Maharan all the time. And he starts to laugh. And he says, not to denigrate Rabbi Nachman, but he said, if your Judaism is nothing more than the study of Musar, 
then you're not really practicing Judaism. You're just studying philosophy. He said, at some point, your Judaism has to result in the application of observing halakha, which is interesting because if you read Rebbe Nachman, just as an aside, Rebbe Nachman never divorces the practice of halakha from, from the philosophies of the Musar. Um, and of course, Kabbalah, it's very difficult to quantify Kabbalah in such a reductionist sense as to say it's simply Musar. But in many practical applications, Kabbalah reduces down to what is essentially Musar. It's a philosophy of spiritual life, philosophy of spiritual existence. And so my personal experience is very interesting because uh, I found during my deconversion from Christianity, I found that the platitudes and bumper sticker slogans of Christianity were unsatisfying to me at a mature adult level of dealing with the problems of life. Uh, and I was attracted to Judaism for several reasons, because one of them was the fact that Christianity attaches its own scriptures to the Jewish scriptures, but it's not the Christian story, it's the Jewish story that they're attaching to. And as yeah. we discussed in the previous program, uh, there's so many places where Christianity uh, approbates scriptures for its own use that are taken wildly out of context, completely out of, it, out of their proper setting, and not according to the teachings of the Jewish tradition. And that, so that reason I bring that up is I found it fascinating as I started studying Rashi and I started studying, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, the Midrash, the Midrashim, I guess I should say, uh, that there are many wild and and fantastical stories within the Midrashim, which are clearly not intended to be taken completely literally, although there are people within the Jewish world who say you should. I'm not one of them. Um, but they are basically allegorizations of the literal Peshat. And the Midrashim are what they consider to be deeper extrapolations of understanding of the given text so they're basically to be critical taking liberty with the text to teach whatever it is you want but in the jewish tradition it's considered to be authoritative so the midrashim let you've got you know probably the most famous is midrash rabbah uh there are many stories in midrash rabbah that no christian would ever read they would never have any clue and so, but that's the Jewish tradition of understanding, very much in the same way that the Catholic Church, while we have, you know, let's just take the Catholic canon of Scripture, for example. So, which is different, of course, from the Protestant canon, but the Catholic canon, which includes a few other books like Tobit and, and whatever. Um, the Catholic tradition, similar to the Jewish tradition, has a long history of commentary on its own tradition. So to properly understand Roman Catholicism, you can't walk into a bishop's office and start quoting him chapter and verse like some brimstone, you know, Baptist preacher and expect to impress the guy because he's got centuries and centuries of oral and written commentary on the tradition, which influences the way he views his faith. And very much. This, yeah, exactly. Very much the same way that a Jewish person who is well instructed in the in the sources of their tradition, if you start saying, well, why does it say here? And this is one of the things that is the problem, for instance, as an example, with a lot of the books that come out by former Christians who try to debunk faith, is they they quickly, it, it's low-hanging fruit. They go to the Old Testament and they start talking about how God ordains slavery and God allows you to stone your children and all these other stupid things that they, there's, it's low-hanging fruit for them. They just say, look, this is the God of the Bible. Why would you ever follow this person? But then you get into the Jewish tradition, like for instance, to take it as an example, the whole tradition of stoning your children. There's an entire volume within the Talmud of literature which deals with this issue and the ultimate ruling of the sages is that there has never been a child which has ever been stoned to death for rebelling against his parents because the problem is the parents if we have a rebellious child it's because we're not as a community educating that child properly 
That's that's in very brief summary, the halakhic ruling of the sages according to that verse. So yeah. when you understand that that's the understanding within Judaism of, of the whole problem of stoning your children for rebellion, you realize that the literal is not the answer. So the literal is the launching pad to a great tradition of, of debate and argumentation, which is culminated in the Talmudic period. After the Mishnaic period, you have the Talmudic period, where the great sages of the first five centuries basically argue out, how do we live Jewish life outside the land of Israel? And that's what the Talmud is all about. And so when you realize, okay, that's the tradition of Judaism. Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, is based on Talmudic argument. It's not based on a literal interpretation of the text of the Tanakh. Well, well you, what are you really dealing with there? You're dealing with a level. So I was in the yeshiva. Let me just make the point and hammer it home. I was in the yeshiva. And it was a Sephardic rabbi. He was not Kabbalistic, but he was a brilliant man. He was a, a posek and at least three main sources of law. And he was he decided he was going to do a Talmud study. So we started in the book of Barachot, and we started in Folio 2a. And we spent two months in the first folio of Berchot. Um, it was intense. And it was it was a series of three weekly lessons that we went through over it was almost a month, where he was talking about Agadeta versus Halacha. Now, for the audience, Halacha is established law within Judaism. Agadetta would be philosophy or application or interpretations. There's many different ways you could describe it, but Agadetta is basically the fine tuning of the tradition within the halacha. And it's unique to each community. But there's a certain philosophy of teaching. And so we went through this whole exercise where he was basically trying to delineate the halacha versus the Agadetta within the Talmudic passage that we were studying. And at one point, I raised my hand and I said, I have a really obnoxious and heretical question. And he says, oh, go ahead. And I said, if theoretically, all halacha is a process of authoritative interpretation, and if all agadeta is subsequently also a process of interpretation isn't all of jewish life agadeta and instantly i was shouted down by like three members in the room like oh that's heretical they didn't say heretical but they're, oh no, no no you don't understand you're new you don't understand and the rabbi was like no 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 let's wait let's wait he said why do you think we have our study group he says david makes a great point he said Every community has its own minhagim, and the minhagim are rooted in agadeta, attributed to halacha. So in other words, you have a tradition of interpretation. So you have one group that has one interpretation of a halacha, and you have another group that has a new interpretation of that halacha, and it becomes essentially minhagim, yeah. which is tradition. So my my view, my personal experience is that you can put down all the rules and regulations you want. At the end of the day, a person's spiritual journey is going to weave in and out of various settings until they find their home. And so Musar, or what we would call disciplines of a godly life or you can throw 15 different phrases at it from different religious backgrounds it all you know like in the new age movement does this resonate with you you know it basically there's there's an inner wisdom of the soul and it finds its level and i find that without musar judaism is very dry and I find that in Christianity, without without 
without applications of personal disciplines of the spiritual life, it, it becomes very voodoo. And, and honestly, I think, you know, my experience has been, like in Christianity, most of the people that were really devout and committed to the faith were not daily meditating upon the basic tenets of the faith. It was always about, have you read this book? Have you read that book? This guy has some amazing things to say. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, or it was Oswald Chambers, or it was what have you. You had these gurus within the Christian tradition who had these deep spiritual insights, and they became the, the light and the banner, if you will, the banner holder of their spiritual journey, not the person Jesus. Jesus was just the figurehead, but the inner the inner uh, community of the believers in that particular setting set their own spiritual temperature by the way that they practice the disciplines of the faith. And I find that Musar in the Jewish tradition, those who are really committed to really wanting to pursue Jewish spirituality, they have to have Musar because, yeah, there's the law. But the law is always filtered through the community in which you're a part of. I mean, if you, you could go into an ultra-Orthodox Satmar community. Uh, what's that? I just said always. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, it's every just, community, it's they always say, go to your rabbi. Because right. your rabbi is going to give you for that community Correct. Uh, what the minhag, the interpretation, the tradition is for that community. I'm writing a novel right now. And I just spilled the beans a little bit. Uh, so my novel is based upon a Sephardic shochet, which is a, a you know, a kosher meat cutter uh, in New York City, who is being threatened and pressured by the Kosher Supervisors Union, uh, which is run by the Ashkenaz, which is historically accurate. Um, now, if you're Ashkenaz, on Pesach, you you don't eat rice or anything like that. If you're Sephardic, you can. I chose to convert Sephardic, and my rabbi laughed at me. He says, you just want to be able to eat rice on Pesach. I'm like, no, that's not why. But when you study the history of it, so, and I don't want to get controversial here, you know, but well, the way I was taught is that traditionally, at least, the Sephardic tradition is more loyal to the original sources Whereas the Ashkenazic tradition is beholden to the Minhagim and the traditions of the community. So there was a time back when in Europe where there was a, a confusion that arose with some bags of rice and beans. And because of the confusion regarding the sources, there was a very powerful rabbi at the time who basically banned the consumption of all rice and beans on Pesach because of the concern about the origin of the product. Whereas the Sephardic didn't have that same concern. So if you go into Torah law, there's nothing prohibiting you from eating rice and beans on Pesach. But if you're Ashkenaz, you will never find rice and beans at a table on Pesach. And most people in Ashkenaz communities assume that rice and beans are non-kosher on Pesach. When that's not true, it's just the minhagim. So this, these are some of the complexities, like, you know, today, like, God forbid you want to order a salad if you're Ashkenaz and ultra-Orthodox in New York City, because how do you know if they've inspected it for bugs? I mean, there's all these crazy things. So I got involved in the minutia of all that when I was going through my conversion process. I got really fascinated with all that stuff. And I started to realize how much of the Jewish world is political and how much is controlled by political powers that nobody wants to cross. I mean, I, I know of of uh, my, my, my Breslov rabbi told me that he knew of a Orthodox rabbi who lost his position because he was seen speaking on a New York City street corner with a, with a reform rabbi. And just the association was enough to have him be suspended from his post which is ridiculously political. I mean, they're all Jews. Like, why would this be? But this is one of the things we deal with. So in my book, 
one of the things that I, I bring forth uh, as it's really kind of fun for me, it's kind of tongue in cheek, is I have this rabbi, this shochet, not this rabbi, but this shochet, he gets in trouble with the kosher supervisors union because he has jello brand gelatin on his shelf in his kosher meat shop, which if you, <laughs> you will not find jello brand gelatin in any Orthodox home because it doesn't have the Orthodox union or any of the kosher symbol on it. But if you understand kosher law, the laws of kashrut, and you understand the law of 164th, you understand that you could have a pot of soup that say is three gallons of soup, and you could throw a small piece of pork lard into that soup, and it would still be kosher because of the law of 164th. It's the same law that relates to when you sleep, it's considered 164th of death. It's the same Jewish principle. So like, for instance, uh, gelatin capsules, a lot of Orthodox Jews will not take medications that are made from capsules that have that are made of gelatin. Technically, it's not a problem because once something has been broken down to such a point that it no longer has flavor or taste, it's no longer considered food. Therefore, it's kosher. This is why kosher this is why Jell-O brand gelatin is actually kosher because it's broken down in a powder form to where it no longer has taste or flavor. It has to have all the other ingredients added to it. And it's therefore it's not in a, it's not in a state of food. It's not unkosher, but because the Orthodox union has refused to put a stamp of approval on it, no Jew will touch it. No, no Orthodox Jew typically will touch Hebrew national hot dogs. Because they say that Triangle K is not a is not a legitimate kosher organization. In fact, of point point of fact, I should say, is that Tri Triangle K has been subjected to a political smear campaign by the Orthodox Union for decades, which has made people feel that it's not a kosher product. When in fact, Triangle K standards are every bit as strict, if not more so, than many of the organizations that. Uh, Orthodox Union endorses. So when you start seeing what's going on behind the scenes, you start realizing how much of religious life is based upon politics and and the impressions that people have, because people ultimately want to be accepted and they want to be considered to be normal in the group that they associate with. And so this makes it incredibly difficult for somebody who's a seeker of truth to ex to excel in any kind of an environment where you ask a lot of questions. That's why that was one of the things that I I was thrilled with Judaism because I got involved yeah. in some of these groups, right? I, and you experienced the same thing where you were encouraged to ask questions. Yeah, like that never happened in my Christian environment. You were considered. Oh no, yeah, we have the answer. You can't depart from it. You know, right. excommunication if you don't follow the line. And yeah, uh, so I, I enjoy and relish the fact that. You know, you know, ask three rabbis, get six opinions that you, right. know, you know, debate is encouraged over having fixed answers. And, and, you know, yes, within Judaism, there's fixed answers, but the debate is encouraged. And and, and the thing that I like about one, the Tanakh and two, the Talmud, one, the my the majority and the minority opinion is recorded. Correct. And, and the and the Tanakh doesn't gloss over the elements about uh slavery or the other things in there it leaves it in there for us to grapple with because the human experience is full of you know the fallen you know like less than you know great experience of humanity we're not right we're not perfect by any stretch of the mean and, and it doesn't try to gloss that over uh in the tanakh there's nobody walking on water there's nobody so perfect so holy that they never make a sin so right. we know that's not true about Jesus that was put into the story, but there's nobody that's that's above flaws. Um, right. Yeah. Well, no, that's true. And one of the things that I always used to point out when I was teaching on the Noahide channel was that um, Judaism is different. Well, I should say Judaism and Islam both are different from Christianity. Uh, is that in both Islam and Judaism, there's no superhero who everybody looks to for the author of their faith. I mean, yes, Islam has Muhammad and whatnot, and Judaism has Moses, but but Judaism is a, a largely an egalitarian tradition where you have a tradition of the elders, 
Now, it gets a little muddy because Christianity claims that as well. I mean, of course, Roman Catholicism was, you know, kind of trying to copy what Judaism had. Plus, they were also copying Mithraism. But um, but you're right. I, I, it's, it's like there's, there's a tradition of argumentation, which somebody who has got a background in Christianity has a very difficult time understanding. Because you get a lot of wish what, what seem to be wishy-washy answers from, from rabbis. You talk to a fire and brimstone preacher, and he'll tell you the facts, you know, how you can be saved and how you'll be lost. You know, in Judaism, he talked to a rabbi. How can one be saved? You're more likely to get, eh, hey, it's a difficult question. And then he'll go off into some story. And it, it's it's at one point on disarming, but it's it's also unnerving for somebody. I think I think Judaism is really hard for people, and I've seen this happen. Certain people feel very insecure if they don't have a list of A, B, C, D answers to their questions. Like, what's the answer to this? Oh, it's this. What's the answer to this? Oh, it's that. P Some people feel very insecure when you give them vague, opaque answers, to direct questions. Um, but what's funny is that I found this to be the case, is that if you look at any spiritual tradition around the world, the real masters of that tradition always give evasive, opaque answers. Because ultimately our journey is personal. And so I, I've always found like that, that's to me one of the secrets to a true spirituality is, is like I consider myself to be kind of a free spirit. Uh, like just for full disclosure, we were talking all about Judaism here, and it sounds like I, I'm an expert on what I'm talking about. Trust me, I'm not an expert on anything. Um, I am non-observant of any religious practice whatsoever at this stage of my life. Now, I went through conversion to Judaism. Uh, I tried to do it through Chabad. I ended up doing it through the conservative movement. And then I tried to join the Orthodox, uh, traditional Orthodox movement, and I was rebuffed. Uh, at that point, my family was at a place where I had to make a decision where I was either going to abandon my family and pursue orthodoxy or I was going to leave religion. And so I decided to keep my family and leave religion. So that's where I'm at. Uh, I don't regret my choice because as, as I've gone forward, I've continued to study. I feel a great sense of freedom uh, and liberation and my ability to just pursue knowledge without feeling an obligation to, to have to be prescribed a certain lifestyle uh some may criticize that some may think that's great uh i'm very very happy with my choice but i did along the way i did learn a lot as you did as well um i don't regret converting uh because it was a tremendous journey as i wrote about in my book it was a tremendously important process for me to go through uh, being raised Roman Catholic, uh, becoming an evangelical pastor, and then eventually leaving that world and converting to Judaism, and now finding my place uh, where I, I'm basically a nun. I'm a non-religious person. Um, but I, I've learned so much about each tradition during the process of going through that journey. Uh, I, I, I didn't come out of it, I guess I would say, and this reflects back to what I was saying to you earlier, I didn't come out of that process bitter and angry. And with an axe to grind, I came out of that process wide eyed in wonderment, like, wow, like, like, there's so much that I don't know. And I learned so much by going through all this. And the fascination of the whole thing is, is those little threads that I never got a chance to follow while I was going through that process. Like you call you, you talk about pulling the threads. There's so many threads that we'd like to pull that, you know, in the in the in the uh, the machinery of religious observance, you don't always get a chance to do that. And so I, I'm really that's my interest right now is is in like what you're doing is trying to get down to the root of things and like what 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 is the basis like as a human being? How did I get wrapped up in this? What did I learn from the process? And where am I at now? That's kind of where I'm at. So yeah, um, so I think we got a little bit off track from the spirituality but i think I mean, so that's my it, fault it was it was quite a it was it was beneficial yeah that was quite there, there was some good things you touched on there um kind of touching on the spirituality a little bit um the essenes some of them see them as 
mystic or having some mystic traditions within it. Uh, there's quite a diverse text within the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, there's there's quite diversity. So, I mean, it covers a lot of things. There was some uh, mysticism within there. You know, I feel like there's there's a connection of mysticism. I'm going to get into some questions a little later. Uh, you touched some stuff about Paul. I'm going to, you know, ask some questions about mysticism, potentially his writing of countering the Essene mysticism and the Philo's influence on, on his. Uh, before we get back into all that stuff, um, I kind of I wanted to get off into a conversation about um, uh, yours and mine experience in ministry. Um, you know, uh, my experience, you know, as a young adult pastor, youth pastor, a small group leader, I've done missions. I've done a lot of various ministry, Bible college. I was on track to, with the Assemblies of God to get ordained and uh, due to ethical reasons, chose not to because of my reliance on Tanakh and disagreements over a whole lot of issues. Um, but along the way, you know, I, I've been through evangelicalism, uh, you know, a lot of altar call kind of, you know, forced conversion, persuasive conversion, um, a lot of healing stuff. Uh, been to meetings with Rodney Howard Brown. Uh, traveled to Pensacola, Florida to experience the magical revival down there, uh, been involved in missionary work. And I can say that in all of my experience, I've never seen or experienced anything outside of what I classify as psychosomatic healing. Uh, nothing, no, no actual miracles ever happened and minor alleviations of things due to, uh, what, what you would call, um, the placebo effect and uh, believing it to be happen and you have a catharsis moment that releases, you feel like you're experiencing healing, your body's lying to you, telling it's okay, when later on you have actual problems. And then like within the ministry, um, I'm, I'm curious of how aware of this you were. Within the revival, charismatic, spiritual awakening thing, there's passing around of sermons that generate excitement within uh, certain ways of doing your altar calls, certain ways of get, you know, trying to persuasive healing and laying on of hands and falling out. Mm -hmm. How aware of you are, um, we're doing it for Jesus to help people experience, you know, it's said to be done for good reasons. So, um, I mean, I don't want to say it was totally nefarious, how yeah. aware of you are of tactics of manipulation within the worship music, mm. altar calls, persuasive healing. Oh, and yeah. stuff. How aware of the manipulation within the ministry were you in? Give some yeah, no, it's a great question. I have a, several chapters in my book where I deal with this exclusively. Uh, I have one chapter in particular called The Music Never Stopped, which was dealing with my experience in Calvary Chapel worship. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, I, I, I'll, I'll detail one conversation i had with my past excuse me i just got the hiccups my pastor at the time i'll just call him uh pastor richard we were doing a building project and we were together drywalling a wall like putting tape and mud on, on a sheetrock and we're just like sitting there you know working and talking and and he was kind of like considering me for an internship at that point for to be a pastor with calvary chapel um, and I was already serving on the worship team and that was a whole story by itself. But to answer your question specifically, uh, I remember one of the attractions I had to Calvary Chapel uh, coming out of, uh, for context, I was coming out of the fundamentalist Baptist mo movement and I was becoming very disillusioned with the fundamentalist Baptist movement because they were so exclusionary of other Christian groups. And I felt that it was inconsistent with jesus's message at the time was why would we have a problem calling another christian brother just because you know they don't have the same cultural standards that we do you know they don't they don't wear suits to church or they go to rock concerts or whatever it is you know that, that you would consider to be you know vile sin um and i remember uh calvary chapel when i read their literature i read their story they were founded by this guy named Chuck Smith in Southern California. And him and his wife ended up reaching out to the hippies on the beach. And the, the big name to claim or uh, claim to fame for Calvary Chapel back in the way, you know, back in the Wayback Machine was that 
they didn't have a dress code. Like you could come off the beach barefoot in your swim trunks and you could just sit down in the church and you could listen to the sermon and you could, and he encouraged people to, you know, create their own music and come up on stage and play it. And they had a contemporary style of music that they encouraged. And they, it was kind of a come as you are thing. And it was at the time, you know, back in the late sixties, this was revolutionary for, you know, for the evangelical world. Uh, now it's kind of mainstreamed. I mean, Calvary Chapel kind of mainstreamed it, but um, but back then it was like considered really revolutionary. And and the big thing that was in the biography of Chuck Smith was that what he claimed transformed the church. Now he had been a Pentecostal preacher, and he at one point committed to preaching verse by verse through the entire Bible. So that the entire congregation would get exposed to what he called the full counsel of God's word. So he went from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. And he would just do that. Like, that that was his routine. Like, he didn't have topical sermons. He would teach through the Bible. And at the time, that was a revolutionary approach to teaching scripture. Uh, and that was what attracted me to Calvary Chapel was the exposition of scripture, was the fact that they didn't leave anything out. They just, they taught everything. Um, but fast forward to this conversation I was having with Pastor Richard in relation to your question and understanding I'm on the worship team. I'm not the lead worship guy, but I'm on the worship team and I'm one of the lead worshipers. And the pastor says to me, he says, hey, I want you to do me a favor. I'm like, what's that? He says, if you see or or know of any uh, chronic sin going on with anyone in the worship team, would you please let me know so that we can deal with it? And I was kind of like, why am I the guy for that? I said, isn't God overseeing everything? Like, why do I have to be the moral police for my teammates? And he just looked at me and he says, why do you have a problem with it? I said, because I'm not the leader of the worship team. And he just kind of like stepped back and he says, what's a leader exactly? Aren't we all called to serve? And I was like, okay, I guess. Sure, I'll do that for you. He's like, okay, very good. I'm really happy about that. And I said, I said, you know, if you don't mind my asking, since we're on the topic, I said, I've been kind of surprised at how much you oversee the worship team. Like, as a pastor, I really thought, as part of the Calvary Chapel model, that you'd be so involved with studying and preparing the word that you'd leave the singing to other people. Like, that's kind of a mundane thing. And he says, no. He says, my mentor, who was the leader of Calvary Chapel Boston, which was a much bigger church, has told me, that the church will never take off until the worship team is cooking. People come to hear the music and experience the worship. The sermon is a, is a plus. The sermon is really for the really devout. But most people come to hear the music. And I was like completely floored to hear that from him. Because I had read the biography of Chuck Smith and that biography never emphasized music as being the key. It was always the preaching of the word. And coming from a fundamentalist background, I was really shocked by this. That, 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 and then I experienced it. So I would be on stage. And like the first time I sang on stage with the worship team, now I have a good singing voice. I used to sing in a rock band. I have, you know, I guess the closest thing you could compare my voice to would be like Jim Morrison. Um, I have a a deep voice, but I can go pretty high. Um, and I never really thought about it much until I sang with the worship team at Calvary Chapel. So the first time I sang, I remember the pastor's wife would not take her eyes off me while I was on stage. She was just like wide-eyed with her mouth open, listening to me sing. And after, after the service, I must have had like a dozen people come up to me and say, oh, that was amazing, Dave. So happy you're up there. You sound great. That was awesome. I had such an experience of worship. I was like, it was so emotional. So the next week, 
when we went to go perform again as a worship team, the worship leader says he wants to have breakfast with me. So we go to this little diner for breakfast. And this guy named Pete, he says to me, hey, hey, hey Dave, he says, I, I got a special favor to ask of you. He said, Richard has asked me if you're willing to stand in the back by the drummer without a microphone and still perform. I'm like, I don't understand. I don't have a problem sitting in the back, but why would you not give me a microphone? He just wants to know if you're willing to do it. Are you willing to sit in the back where no one can see you and sing your heart out without a microphone? I said, what would be the point exactly? Like, why would you have me up there if I'm not going to be mic'd up? Like, no one's going to hear me. He said, the Lord will hear you. I said, this is stupid. I said, I've been volunteering my time twice a week for the last four months practicing with you guys. I said, I work full time. And I said, last week was the first time I ever performed with you live in front of their congregation. I said, now you're asking me to stand by the drummer with no microphone. I'm like, am I wasting my time? I said, I have other things I can do. I said, I don't need to do this. And he says, I know, Dave. He says, it's not from me. I totally get it. But if you did it, it would really bless me. And so for his sake, I agreed to it. So I agreed to it. So I stood back there for two services now. They did two services. Two services of standing by the drummer with no microphone, singing the songs, and no one could hear me. At the end of both services, I had people coming up to me, asking me, what was that about? That was so stupid. Why would you be willing to be up there without a microphone? Um, so um, I was pretty distraught about this. And so I, I mentioned to Pete, the worship leader, I'm like, this is a, this is insanity. Like, like, what, what are you guys doing? And so he said, well, Dave, he said, I promised Richard when I took over the worship leader position that I would be happy to lead the worship team but it was his responsibility to say who could be on or off the team. He says, maybe Richard's struggling with you. Maybe he's got a check about you. And that was a big thing in the evangelical world. If you had a check about something, I mean, the Holy Spirit was like checking you. Um, it's such BS. But anyways, uh, so it turned out, I finally got my explanation, was that number one, I was a little too good looking. And number two, I had too good of a voice. And the pastor was intimidated by it, which I didn't understand at all. But that's the explanation I got. Well, then I finally got the explanation as to why that would have been a problem. And it turned out that the church that he had come from in San Diego had experienced a massive church split because of the worship leader. The worship leader was a very charismatic personality, very good looking guy, had a great voice. He was erudite with the word, as I was too. I was a teacher. And he, so the pastor, the lead pastor, had to be hospitalized and take a leave of absence for some months. And during the period where the lead pastor was gone, the worship leader basically did a whole Solomon thing, and he started drawing a whole contingent of the congregation to himself. Now, this was a congregation of, say, you know, seven to 10,000 people, not, not like the church I was in. But my pastor at this Calvary Chapel had been in that church when that had gone on. And so all of a sudden, I realized that me simply wanting to serve and be of use to God was now considered to be a mortal threat to the authority of this pastor, because he was not good looking. He did not have a singing voice. He was very plain in his uh, preaching of the word. I was very flamboyant. I was very, you know, uh, I don't know the word for it. I was very charismatic in my, uh, in my exposition. So I didn't know this, but it turned out that he was really threatened by me. And so what this means is that so in Calvary Chapel, I don't know how other churches do it, but in Calvary Chapel, because they have so many lay people involved in ministry, they do these series of poke tests where they're, they'll test your loyalty. They'll, they'll put you in very compromising situations and see how you react to it. And we talked about this a little bit in our last conversation. I don't want to belabor it. But I remember being on stage with all that that I just shared as context with my acoustic guitar 
singing some traditional top 40 style worship song that was popular. And as I'm swaying and singing, I'm watching women and men in the audience swaying in synchronicity with me and their eyes becoming glossed over. And they, they're, they're, they're supposedly praying and singing to Jesus, but they're completely reflecting the lead of the worship leaders on stage. And I remembered a moment on stage in front of, I don't know, 600 people where I was singing and I was controlling the emotions of the room. Like I could speed up and slow down the cadence of the song and people would react by either getting really intense and they'd lower their heads or they'd raise their hands and start hopping up and down. And it was completely a manipulation tactic. And I remember my pastor had told me that the reason why we do this, and it, like he said, I don't care if you guys play 20 minutes or if you play an hour. I want the people to be at such a place of surrender that I can preach to them. So the whole idea was to use music to manipulate and massage the emotions and the mindset of the audience so that they were completely receptive without a barrier to whatever it was the pastor wanted to share. That was the whole mentality. Of course, they, their spiritualizing of it was that, oh, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta marinate the flesh so that the spirit can receive. Mm -hmm. I'm but sorry, but I know. But, the, but then they use it to, for when they do uh, tithe and offering calls. Oh yeah. Calls, and all it's all very, get them in that emotional state yes. that they're easily manipulated. Even so, yeah, it's a great point, Jeremiah. So if I go back to my fundamentalist Baptist days, you know, let's let, let's leave aside the charismatic expression, you know, let's talk about a, a fundamental Bible preaching church that doesn't go for any of that crap. Well, I'm sorry, but even the fundamentalist who claims that they, they never wanted to have an electric guitar on stage or a band, it was amazing at the end of every sermon, all of a sudden the piano would start to play oh. and you start to hear... You know, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. And everybody starts to, let's pray together for the lost, right? And your heart strings start to get tugged. And then they have the altar call or, you know, nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? You have these songs and they don't necessarily have anything to do with doctrine. They have to do with a picture in your mind of what you're, grabbing onto it's very much the same thing as you know in the civil war you'd have a drummer boy that would drum beat the march right that music would get the, the reluctant soldiers to keep putting one foot in front of the other and in, and in religion it, it always amazes me that especially in christianity how music is used as a tool just as they preach against it as a secular devil device uh to steal the souls of our youth they use the same tools to try to manipulate them within the church. And it's always incredible to me because like I used to be involved in youth groups and the sexual promiscuity rate within Christian youth groups is actually higher than the secular yeah. world, Yeah, which is incredible. Yeah. Like, like something's wrong with this picture. Anyways. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, you but, touched on some good stuff there. That's for sure. Um, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the thing is when I, when I converted to Judaism, one of the things that I loved about, uh, Shabbat services is that, uh, at, at the minion we were at, you know, there's no instrumentation. It's a pure offering to God. There's no swelling music or anything. It was purely just something you give to God and there's no, you don't have to be coaxed into a certain state of mind or right. a certain feeling or anything like that. So that was, that was, to me, that was kind of a, a healing for my soul where I'm not being uh, emotionally persuaded by somebody else. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to get back to something that you had talked about earlier and touched on a little bit, um, taking a deep, deeper drive into deconstructing Christian doctrine and theology. You kind of mentioned um, Paul and Christian misunderstandings of the LXX or the Greek Septuagint. 
uh, you know, how Paul and some of his stuff may have been situa situated within Hellenistic, Hellenistic Judaism. Um, it, you know, um, you, you mentioned Philo and the mystical parts of like Philo, maybe elements of Neoplatonism, how uh, the Logos, maybe that even plays on the Memra tradition. Um, yeah. How this hodgepodge of stuff, maybe one, I want to touch on the misunderstandings Christians and Paul had of Tanakh and how they may have been pulling on the Hellenistic mystical tradition and maybe even flipping some of the Essene mysticism on its head or responding to it in a contra narrative. And that's a lot. <laughs> but, no, it is. Yeah. So let's talk about the Essene. So one of the things that I appreciate about the work of uh, Robert Eisenman, who is an expert in the Dead Sea Scrolls, is the fact that he highlights, much to the chagrin of many scholars, he highlights the violent apocalyptic nature of the Essenes community. Uh, they were not that they were personally violent, but they had a, a view of apocalypticism that was very end times focused. Yeah. And they believed that God was going to come to the rescue of the righteous remnant who they considered themselves to be a part of. Uh, so they were an aesthetic community that practiced uh, separatism. Um, they practiced aestheticism. They practiced <laughs> self-denial. Uh, we find all of these elements in various segments of the early Christian communities. Uh, we find everything from the Encratites, which were uh, voluntarily celibate, even though they were married. We find elements of, uh, of celibacy. You know, Paul even alludes to this when he says, be married as though you are not. Uh, it looks like a reference to the Encratite movement. Um, we have that element exists in the Essene community. Uh, it's well known that John the Baptist, John the Apostle, perhaps even Jesus himself are associated in some way with the Essene community. Then you also have the Therapeutes, the Therapeutes which come from Alexandria, which were mystical healers. They were mystical healers and preachers uh, that were preaching the kingdom of God, but they were preaching it not in an apocalyptic armageddon type fashion but more of a uh, of a gnostic tradition uh there's a lot of elements of the christian uh teachings that also have their relationship to the therapeutes in my opinion uh so we have these early elements and i think one of the things that can't be overlooked so gershom sholem uh in his compilation of essays called the messianic idea in judaism uh, a seminal work which is widely referenced by anybody who studies kabbalah uh, or anybody who studies messianism so uh, sholem says in his book and i'm paraphrasing because i don't have it right in front of me I, I do quote it verbatim in my book but sholem says that apocalypticism is a a movement or, or an ideology of destruction that the ideal of, a, of an apocalyptic spiritualist is that nothing will improve until the current incarnation is destroyed so it's a it's an ideology of of an expectation of destruction and it's impossible in sholem's view to properly understand the jewish hellenized greco-roman world of the of the centuries in which we're dealing with here with the earliest origins of christianity and of Judaism, for that matter, uh, it's impossible to understand the mindset of the different factions if we don't understand the importance of an end-time mindset. Uh, now, one of the things that my deepest, one of my deepest criticisms of Christianity is that in the Jewish world, the last apocalyptic messiah figure that exists in jewish history as far as traditional jewish expectations was bar kokhba and when his rebellion in 135 was 
was repulsed by Rome, that was the essentially the end of the Jewish Roman conflict. Rome finally won. And at that point, after that, it's not until after Bar Kokhba that you start seeing in Jewish sources the concept of the two messiahs, the Messiah ben Joseph and the Messiah ben David, the suffering Messiah and the conquering Messiah. Because there had to be some kind of a cognitive dissonant resolution to the fact that our time was ripe and our salvation didn't come. And so starting with the Talmudic period, there's a drastic and intentional shift within the Jewish world away from apocalyptic messianism and towards a community-based Judaism that would be sustainable in diaspora. Yeah. Right? Whereas Pauline Christianity went in the other direction. Pauline Christianity, rather than abandoning the apocalyptic injunction of the time is nigh, Jesus is about to return, went into this uh, kind of a, of a pseudo apocalyptic expectation of, well, as long as you have Jesus in you, then you'll be ready for whenever that time comes. And it could be nigh, it could be any moment. Well, now we're 2,000 years in, and Christianity is still living on this ridiculous fantasy of some kind of a return of Christ, yeah. expressed as it, as it were through the rapture doctrine, which most Christians don't even know, never even existed in church history until less than 200 years ago. So the rapture doctrine has now captured the imagination of evangelical Christians to the point that some denominations, if you don't believe in the rapture, you're not even considered part of the fold. Whereas Judaism has always been very clear, with some caveats, which I will explain. If someone or someone claims of someone to be a Messiah candidate, they must fulfill certain roles. Without getting into all those different conditions, one of the chief ones is, and this is according to halacha, this is according to Jewish law, it's in the Talmud, that if the Messiah figure dies without fulfilling all the conditions of the Messiahship, they are clearly disqualified as being the Messiah. So from a Jewish perspective, whether or not Jesus actually existed, the claims made by the New Testament of Jesus as the Messiah of the Jewish people are instantly discredited by anyone who understands Jewish law by the fact that he died without fulfilling the messianic expectations. Everything's in the future. Mm -hmm. So he's no different than Bar Kokhba or anyone else who claims to be that person. Now, there's never been, nonetheless, a lack of messianic zeal among many within the Jewish community. A perfect example of this is the tragedy of Shabbatai Zvi in the Middle Ages, who was widely... Now, I had one rabbi tell me that, contrary to what you will hear from many mainstream sources, that the majority of the Jewish world was ready to follow Shabbatai Zvi in Europe. That's why it was such a tragedy. Because he led people, now he was the founder of a movement which basically, and, and Gershom Sholem again details this explicitly in his essays, he led a movement that was basically, redemption will come through the sin of the people. Doctrine of redemption through sin. So it leads to uh, such perversions as Jacob Frank. So Frankism, which still exists in certain elements in the Jewish world today, which is basically a hedonism in the name of Torah, that since we can't perfectly you know, perform the law, we will, we will pursue sin to such a degree that it will shatter the klipot and God will be forced to come rescue us like the seventh Calvary. It's this whole idea. Um, not dissimilar, by the way, to some of the modern expressions of modern evangelical Christianity, which basically says, come one, come all, bring all your baggage, bring your sin, it doesn't matter, put it on the cross, put it on Jesus, and he will take it all, and he'll just carry the weight, and you'll just, 
that's not so much dissimilar. There's a lot of, uh, of Shabbatai V doctrine in some of modern evangelical seeker-friendly expressions. Uh, but that being what it is, that's just my opinion. Um, so there's always been this apocalyptic element within Judaism, but traditionally, traditional Judaism does not bank upon apocalyptic promises. It follows the law. And so this is one of the reasons why organizations like Chabad have found such a hard time being accepted by traditional Jewish organizations because they're viewed as not being real Judaism because they're so messianic. And that's why so many messianics get attracted to Chabad because they're of the same mindset. But again, I'm going off on a rabbit trail on you. I apologize. Um, the So I wanted to kind of touch on the... Um the where christians and paul get the tanakh wrong yep okay the places that they find support for their views within the hellenistic jewish mystical tradition of like philo and the logos and the memra uh that was so when you could yeah so paul yeah sorry i got sidetracked so paul so i have a particular view on paul which is kind of an agreement with robert uh price I believe the letters of Paul, and I'm talking all the letters of Paul, are highly layered and redactional. I think there's very little original core Paul that we have. I think most of what we have of Paul is the later Roman Catholic Church messing with the text and using Paul's name for their own use. They couldn't dismiss Paul altogether because he had too much of a following thanks to Marcion, so that when they rejected Marcion, they couldn't just throw Paul out with the bathwater. They had to redact and adopt Paul to fit Catholic dogma. And so you see, as Price points out, many stitch points within Paul's letters where it looks like the letter should end, and then it suddenly continues, and it seems to argue against itself. You have yeah. later church uh, scribes trying to fit Paul's narrative into a later church orthodoxy <clears throat> whereas paul originally seems to be if you if you if you agree with the idea of core paul uh paul seems to uh, adopt more of a freewheeling um almost a hellenized jewish approach to spirituality <clears throat> that doesn't really care if you keep torah or not uh galatians is pretty clear i mean i remember when i was part of the messianic jewish movement we had all these commentaries trying to convince us that we got to figure out how to read paul so that he's not anti-torah i'm sorry there, if you no can't way. yeah it, it, you cannot read galatians yeah. just as a point of fact you cannot read galatians as anything but an attack on a jewish orthodox torah view it, yeah. it, it's there's just no other way to do it no no orthodox jew will ever read galatians and not throw it in the air and say heresy this is blasphemy yeah. so paul was clearly not concerned about roping his jewish brethren into the fold through the book of galatians if that in fact is core paul um yeah. I, i'm a little unsettled uh you mentioned in the last conversation you know uh through text to maybe further clarify the the, the dutch high critical position so I'm not an expert on it, but the Dutch high critical position basically, essentially, casts into doubt the authorship of any of Paul's letters, that all of them are forgeries. Um, I'm not sure that I'm willing to go that far, uh, but I do go further in that direction than I, I am not willing to assume that Paul wrote in the 50s. And the reason is because we don't have... Here, here's the context and now we're getting a little bit back into the roman providence thing again my view on roman providence is kind of unique my, my roman providence position is that rome controlled the distribution of the text that we have ultimately and they oh, censored yeah. the ones yeah. they didn't want to go out so that's where roman providence comes in for me as rome ultimately controlled the narrative but there was a time where uh, first, and I, I will say this again, and there's other modern scholars that will back this up, that in, in ancient times, you had to have money and influence to get things published and circulated. You couldn't, as a fisherman in Galilee, get a gospel produced and have it circulated. People that wrote things had money and they had connections. So when you look at the main players 
on the stage of the Jewish and Roman world at the time of the conquering of Jerusalem. You had Philo in Alexandria, you had Herod in Judea, and you had the Vespasians who ended up hiring. Um, okay, I got you. You had uh, 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 Vespasian ends up hiring uh, Josephus, a former Essene himself, former Jewish general, to be his personal court scribe. So he's his propagandist. I'm of the opinion, and we're going off a little bit here, that the only writings that we had in the first century was Josephus. And I think this is where Joseph Atwell stumbles yeah. upon this connection between the Gospels and the writings of Josephus. Is I think the Gospels are second century documents. And I think some of the authors, particularly Luke, who, who Atwell highlights, used Josephus as a template to craft the bio biographical story of Jesus. That's where I think Atwell stumbles on this sequence and, and similarity. But that doesn't mean that Josephus wrote the Gospels. I think, I think what, it, what it says to us is that we had a spiritual tradition which was burgeoning in the empire, uh, primarily in the diaspora. You had a certain core Jewish element, such as the Ebionites and others that were really trying to stay true to Torah Judaism. But, but understand, my point in saying all this, by the time of the writing of the New Testament texts, even if we're going to assume that Paul wrote in the 50s, the reality is the earliest church documentarians have no knowledge of Paul. We don't know anything of Paul until Marcion comes from Turkey and says, I found the letters of Paul. There's no knowledge of Paul before then. He's never mentioned. So I have to ask myself, so who the heck is Paul? Because if, if, you, if you consider the reality, that the and this is a fact, that the first known gospel ever published was Marcion's Gospel of the Lord around 135 A.D., now, we scholars say, oh, Mark was published in around 70, and Luke was published a little bit after that, and John was around 100 AD. The fact of the matter is that we don't have any fragments of any of those texts, except for a little fragment of John that dates to around the mid-2nd century. Yeah. So that's just the facts. Now, if something turns up since then, great. But all we know is that if the Gospels, even, even let's just be conservative about it. Let's assume that the Gospels were published after 70 AD. Let's say around 100 to 120 AD. I'm very, very dubious of those dates. I think they're much later, but because of Roman censorship particularly. But let's just assume, right? Now, more than likely, based on the Nag Hammadi corpus, we had Gnostic Gospels being circulated long before the current canon which was now endorsed, but that even being aside, once you get to 100 AD, you're dealing with a destroyed Jerusalem, a destroyed Judea. The Jews have all been exiled. There's a small contingent that are remain behind, but for the most part, it's become a wasteland and everybody's in the diaspora. And all of the supposed eyewitnesses of the Jesus story are now dead. And all the archaeological evidence that would have been extant for that story has been destroyed. And many of the documents and texts that would have been available have all been confiscated and or destroyed by the Romans. Yeah. So that's where Roman provenance comes in to me, is Rome came in and swept the slate clean. And but much like the like ISIS today, going in and destroying monuments, destroying artifacts, destroying documents, all for its own purpose, for its own political purpose. So it's very, very dubious for me to think that, that you had some organic Jesus movement that survived the destruction of Jerusalem. To me, I think the Jesus movement comes from outside of that milieu. I, to me, the most likely scenario for the Jesus movement is Alexandria. And that if Paul was existent in the 50s, he was a student of the schools of Philo and of the spiritual elements of combining Judaism with Hellenized Greek philosophy, 
stoicism and all these other things and that's why i i think that's why you know for instance in the, in the early church centuries we have this fictitious which was proven to be fictitious uh dialogue between seneca and paul seneca the great roman philosopher greek philosopher having this great dialogue with paul where paul's ideas are shown in a very positive light according to the philosophies of seneca well how could that possibly be if paul is a torah orthodox jew there's, there's an incongruity there uh and then you also have the other element i'll just say this lastly that the babylonian schools existed at the sufferance of the roman leaders in the Talmud, I've read them myself, there's many passages in the Talmud where you see great Jewish leaders having dialogue and, and interaction with Roman leaders, even to the point that some Roman leaders want to convert to Judaism. That's existing in the Talmud. Of course, you know, this is from a Jewish perspective, maybe they're telling their side of the story. But the point is that we have political dialogue going on between the survivors of the Jewish destruction and those who founded the schools that ended up becoming the Talmudic sages uh, and the Roman emperors going forward, where Judaism was allowed to flourish on its own little limited space, where it wasn't a military threat anymore, and the Roman thing was allowed to, and, and then Rome eventually yeah. adopted Christianity, and so you have these two religions that grow somewhat side by side, one in l l large obscurity for many centuries, the other one starts to dominate the world, uh, and really, you know, we're, we're, li we're living in a time where Israel exists again, which is, you know, that was un unimaginable for everyone for centuries. So anyways, I don't know if I rambled too much there, or if I made any sense at all, but so much. Oh, you, made some, you made some good sense. Um, again, we're pulling the thread and we got more threads that we can pull. Um, no, I feel like we covered some good stuff today. And um there's so there's definitely more that we can keep pulling on here um, yeah I, I want to ask you a bunch of questions too because you've you read a lot as well and you have some different opinions and some things that i do so yeah um i mean we can definitely try to have more of an interaction in, in future ones uh right now because it's summertime my kids are here my time's kind of limited the space that i record is limited no problem. um i'm i'm not in the the greatest mental space to be prepared for you know, answering questions so we can schedule maybe one where we kind of flip it and uh, say you interview me a little more. Um, but uh, but yeah, so but uh, I've enjoyed these. We're getting some positive feedback on this. It's um, I, I enjoy the dialogue that, you know, there's some, you know, you definitely present some very interesting, compelling ideas. Um, and, I, and I think it's good to expose people to a lot of these ideas. So you know, we're kind of in the shared realm there. Yeah. And just so um, everyone then, knows, I claim no, not to be an expert on anything. I'm just a layman who just has, I've read a lot and an I have independent opinions. scholar. Yeah. I just, I don't, I'm not dogmatic on anything I share. So. Yeah. Well, but you have a wealth of knowledge. You have many years of experience within, you know, Christianity, Judaism. And so the things that you've learned, you have something to offer. Um, that's kind of how I come to this. Um, feel like I've spent 30, 40 years with information and uh, all the cobwebs rattling around in my head. I got to find something to do with it. Absolutely. So very but, good. Um, I appreciate you for taking the time and um, uh, we'll do this again in the future. Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you, Jeremiah. All right.